Um, okay, we're going to begin with Matthew Landsberg. His collection of linked stories outside is the Iowa Short Fiction Award and was a finalist for the 30th Annual Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction and the 2018 Pharaoh Grumley Award for LGBTQ Fiction. His work has been shortlisted in the Best American Short Stories series. Okay, thank you for being with us, Matthew. The floor Great is cool. yours. Thank you so much, uh, Leah, Gwen, and Adam for organizing this wonderful event for all of the people who've logged in tonight. Uh, it's such an honor to read with Laura and Emily and Jesus. Um, I've decided to read something new today. It's a scene from a short story I've been working on that may or may not become part of a novel. The characters in the scene are actually two characters from my book, Outside is the Ocean, which was about a woman named Taika, who's a German immigrant, and her gay son named Stuart. When I finished writing Outside is the Ocean, I thought I was done working with these characters. But recently I found myself wondering how Stuart would react if his mother came back to visit him from the dead. So I've been writing some stories to see what happens to Heike after she dies. In the scene I'm gonna read, Stuart has gone home to California after his mother's death to clean up her condo. The scene takes place about two thirds of the way into the story when Stuart has just met with a real estate agent to list the condo and his mother appears out of nowhere for the second time that day. The first time she appeared, Stuart was at Vaughn's going grocery shopping and after a few minutes of chatting with him, she just disappears into thin air, leaving him wondering whether he'd been hallucinating. So this is a little section of uh, the story last night in Ventana Beach. Stuart had just opened the door to his mother's place when he saw someone standing in the narrow hallway near the washer and dryer. Well, she seemed promising, Heike said, I liked her. My God, you scared me, Stuart nearly shouted. Although the house was getting darker, he was quite sure this was not a hallucination. What are you doing here? Recently, he'd switched SSRIs and he wondered if that had been a mistake. I'm sorry, his mother said. She was wearing the same tennis skirt and hot pink zip-up jacket she'd been wearing at Vons, but she no longer had on the visor or sunglasses. She held a banana peel in her hand and was chewing. I didn't mean to scare you. I just wanted to say hi and see what you thought of the agent. I thought she seemed nice. She had pretty crooked teeth for a real estate agent, but she had warm eyes. You're freaking me out. Aren't you supposed to be dead? I know, I know, don't worry. I'm not here to bother you. I know how you are about wanting your privacy. It's just a little boring up there in heaven. I got a pass to come down and pay you a visit. I can go back if you don't want me here. It's okay, you did your obligation. You threw me a nice funeral and put flowers on my grave. You shed your tears. I must say I was surprised, but it seemed genuine. I was touched. He stared at her, not sure whether he should embrace her or call 911. He wondered whether maybe she'd changed her mind about the will and was coming back to sign a last minute codicil to bequeath her possessions to the seven-year-old girl in Tegucigalpa with the cleft lip. She didn't seem angry with him anymore, but when she was alive, she was often mercurial. Don't look so disturbed, she continued. You don't have to worry that I'm coming back here to pester you. My pass expires tonight at 9.30. I asked for an extension, but these angels are very strict. You know how it is, everything is by the book up there. She nodded towards the popcorn ceiling. I'm not disturbed, I'm just surprised, Stuart managed. It's not, he struggled to find the right word, normal. Normal, normal, what means normal? Nothing is ever normal. You think having me die of a stroke at the age of 79 is normal? I was a very healthy woman. I played tennis every day. Look how good my figure is, she said, directing his attention to various parts of her body. I told them my time hadn't come yet. I said they should give me at least another year so I can go skiing again to Mammoth or visit my family in Germany one last time, but they wouldn't budge. Stuart glanced at the banana peel. Want me to take that? I'm sorry, I hope you're not mad at me for taking one of your bananas. I know how careful you are with your food. No, it's fine, Jesus, eat the bananas, I don't care. Do you want some turkey breast, want an orange? Are you sure you don't mind, she asked. I don't wanna eat you dry. He told her she could have whatever she wanted and soon enough, they were in the kitchen and she was peeling one of the navel oranges with the little paring knife she used to use, then eating the fruit with her fingers. 
She hadn't washed her hands, but he, what did he care? She was dead. She wasn't making him suffer, and he didn't think she was going to try to feed him any of the orange sections. Delicious, she said, wiping her mouth with her sleeve. So juicy. Everything up there tastes horribly bland. You wouldn't believe it. You'd think in heaven the food would be good, but it's all like wet cardboard. They gave us a tiny bowl of fruit salad this morning with breakfast, and it tasted like airplane food. Little slivers of unripened oranges and artificial peaches and syrup. I almost sent it back, but you can't do that as a newcomer. You have to be very appreciative and thankful so you don't get a reputation. I can already tell there are cliques. There's a group of old women who play canasta together, and they refuse to make eye contact with me. Very standoffish. Stuart thought about getting his iPhone, which he'd left on the dining room table, and asking his mother whether he could make a video of her. It was something he'd been meaning to do while she was alive, but he'd never gotten around to it. He knew everyone would think he'd lost it if he told them his mother had come back from the dead to visit him. He knew the only way they'd believe him was if he had proof. But he was worried that if he walked into the other room to get his phone, his mother might vanish again. On the other hand, he knew that something like this would generate an insane number of comments on Facebook. Did you hear me, she said, are you listening? Yes, canasta, you said you were playing canasta. No, I did not say I was playing canasta. I said I asked them whether they have any tennis courts and they said they're being repaired. I went to see what they had and it was ridiculous, two old courts full of cracks in the surface. It was like East Germany. I told them I need some exercise. I can't just sit inside all day long staring at the TV and watching these old fogies play bingo. bingo. She took one of the dish towels from the drawer and said, I hope you're not giving away all this nice silverware. That's Grandma Miller's, you know, it's very valuable. He looked at the forks and spoons and knives that had been sitting in the drawer for decades, growing more and more tarnished. It's valuable? Of course it's valuable, it's silver, real silver. You could take it down to the pawn shop and get yourself a nice watch. He started laughing. What's so funny, why are you laughing at me? It's just so weird that you're here. I mean, don't you think it's bizarre? It's not bizarre. I lived through the war. I saw people starving to death. I ate grass for supper. Is that not bizarre? Now people spend all day looking at their phones and texting each other. You think that's normal? I don't know. This is different. Ugh, stop analyzing everything so much. You have me here now. Be grateful. Now you can give me a proper goodbye. He wasn't sure what she meant. Did, he, did she want him to hug her? Did she want him to give her a kiss? He'd always avoided kissing her on the lips, but he figured maybe he should stop being so squeamish given the circumstances. He wondered whether perhaps she wanted him to take her to the sizzler for steak and prime rib. I'm grateful, he said. I'm grateful. I'm glad you're here. Let me get my phone so I can take a photo of you. No, no photos. I look terrible. My hair is a mess. You want to waste our precious time together on photos? You have a closet full of albums of me. He told her her hair looked great. He said he wanted a photo so he could remember her after she was gone. Okay, fine, she replied. Let me at least go to the ladies' room first and put on some rouge. As she walked away, he noticed that she hadn't taken off her shoes. She was wearing the tree torn she'd always worn when she played tennis, despite the fact that previously she'd forbidden people from wearing shoes in the house. He went back to the dining room where he'd begun filling trash bags with old placemats along with the board games they played when he visited and his mother's tchotchkes, the carved wooden shepherd and the beer stein and the framed Edelweiss she'd given him for his 15th birthday. He quickly rescued the Edelweiss and wood carving from the trash bag and put them back on the mantel. The last thing he needed was to have a fight with her now about which items he was keeping and which he was giving away. When Heike came back from the bathroom, he was sitting on the couch. I hope it's okay I went big, she said. I've been terribly constipated and really had to go. The toilet paper up there is like sandpaper. When she was still alive, this was the kind of comment he might have objected to. But now, here, he said he was glad she was feeling better. He patted a place on the couch next to him and said he wanted to make a video of her. A video? Why a video? It was something I was always meaning to do but you don't have any children. Who are you gonna show a video of your old mother to? I'm not even properly dressed. He told her he wasn't gonna show the video to anyone, that it was just for him to remember her. He told her he wanted her to yodel. He said he wanted to hear, to hear her tell him about the men she dated after his father divorced her, about Bob Kelly and Richard Chastain and the artist from Encinitas who sold spray painted thistles on the beach whenever it wasn't raining. 
Heiko was a born storyteller and soon enough she was telling him what it was like to grow up in Germany during the war and how she came to the United States to work as a maid when she was just 21 and about the men who tried to seduce her when she was still very innocent. Stuart held the phone up and made sure his mother's face was centered on the screen, trying not to jiggle his hands. He kept wanting to bring up their fight about the sweater from Kmart, to apologize for not being more gracious and trying it on. He wanted to thank her for not disinheriting him, but he decided not to interrupt because she was on a roll. As Heike talked, he noticed that he didn't feel any of the anxiety he experienced when she was still alive. For whatever reason, he was no longer afraid she might become hysterical or unhinged. Heike had been talking for close to an hour when she finally paused and said, okay, that's enough. Aren't you getting cold? It's like winter in here. It was dark now except for the light in the kitchen. They were still sitting on the couch and Stuart had to pee. He stopped the recording and told his mother he'd be back in a second. I'll get you a blanket, he said, and headed into the bathroom. He sat on the toilet because he'd reached the age where he found it easier to empty his bladder sitting down, and he felt the soles of his feet and the crown of his head fill with light. A tingling sensation filled the roots of his teeth. He wondered if his mother knew that he'd given Coco away to the neighbors and whether she'd be mad at him for not taking the dog back to New York. He wondered whether she was going to ask him what he was planning to do with the money she'd left him and whether she might try to extract some kind of promise from him. On his way back to the living room, he turned on the lights and took the comforter off his mother's bed and jacked the thermostat up to 74. When he returned to the living room, the couch was empty and his mother was gone. Mom, he called, I got you a blanket. He waited for her reply, but the only sound he heard was the furnace lighting up. It was a sound he associated with winter time and with being in bed, because when she was alive, his mother had always avoided turning on the heater, except in the early morning in January and February, when the temperature indoors dipped into the 40s. This was a long time ago when Heike was married to Jerry and Stuart had fewer boundaries, back when he was still in his 20s and 30s and the future seemed expansive and open and hopeful. Thanks, that's the end of the scene. Thank you, Matthew, that was great. Okay, next we have Emily Nimmons. Emily's debut novel, The Cactus League, was published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux in February 2020 to critical acclaim. Nimmons' fiction has appeared in N Plus One, the Iowa Review, and the Gettysburg Review. She lives in New York, where she edits the Paris Review. Thank you, Leah. Um, thank you, Matthew, for that great reading. I um, so riveting, Ghost Mom, <laughs> and uh, Gwen and Adam, and everyone at Sewanee. Thank you for getting us together here tonight. And Laura and Jesus, I look forward to to your readings as well. Um, the Cactus League is this episodic uh, tour through spring training uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, every chapter sort of looks at a different subset and subculture of, of spring training baseball and a different community that's all sort of wound up with this fictional team, the Los Angeles Lions and their star, Jason Goodyear. But I didn't want it to just be, you know, focus in on the $200 million man. I really wanted to sort of tour around the ballpark. And I wanted to read the first few pages of a chapter called The Cycle, which I actually worked on quite a bit with Adrian Haroon and um, John Casey in 2014 when I was at the conference. There has never been an E flat in Take Me Out to the Ball Game, at least not when it's played in the standard key of C. I should note there's gonna, I apologize for two things, um, my singing and also uh, there's a few swear words. Lester Morrow knows this, but he hits the note anyway. The song lurches, the crowd stutters in their stretch. The Mariner shortstop, tossing warm up with the third baseman, drops the ball in the dirt. Nothing to do but keep on keeping on. So Lester plays out the line, half humming, half muttering to himself the familiar refrain. One, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. He runs his fingers over the keyboard in an upward arpeggio two hands racing at once, like a flourish at the end will save him. 
With the last note, he winces at the creak in his left hand, but he keeps the keys pressed down for a full two measures. Outside his open window, the organ reverberates through the ballpark and loosens into the spring air. As the song ends, the crowd settles back into their seats. The Mariners, dressed in gray, toss their practice balls toward the dugout and take their positions, doing what they can to preserve their energy in the Arizona heat. Lester twists to watch the action, resting his left elbow on the ledge of the keyboard and cupping his chin in his palm. William Goslin, the Los Angeles Lions' top draft pick and the great grand something of Goose, leads off the bottom of the seventh for the Lions. He takes a few last triple bat whiffs in the on-deck circle, then drops two of the sticks, taps his spikes, and steps up to the plate. In the next booth over, Lester's colleague announces, number 19, William Goslin, first base. The sound carries from the mic to the stadium's PA and back to Lester's booth on a flutter of wind. Lester scrutinizes the rookie. The team has high hopes. Goslin was their first rounder, eighth overall, in last June's amateur draft, but he's had a tough spring batting all of 185. He'll be going back down to double A if he's lucky. From Lester's vantage, it's unclear if, in keeping him around into the third week of March, management is giving him good experience or just letting him ride a bit. Fair response either way. The boy points the tip of his bat to first, second, and third base, then settles into his knock-kneed stance. The pitcher rolls his shoulders and cracks his neck. The second baseman arranges the dirt in front of him with a pointed toe. All of a sudden, a sharp chromatic bleat tumbles out of Lester's machine. The batter and the pitcher both look instinctively towards the sky. A flock of amplified geese? Christ, Lester mumbles. He reaches for the power button, a tiny red beacon on the machine's upper left corner. On the way, his finger traces over marimba, xylophone, and tuba options, but also a pack of dogs large, a pack of dogs small, and elephant. He'll never get the hang of this newfangled thing. Give him a couple of wood blocks and an air horn any day. He depresses the red button off. Phew. The kid is down in the count, having watched one trail outside and then taken two bad missed swings when Joe Templeton bursts into the booth. Lester, what the fuck? Hi, Joe. Lester glances toward the open window, worried the profanity will drift into the crowd. Sorry, Joe. Sorry, my ass. You playing with your toes or something? Lester shakes his head now. Joe Templeton, director of stadium operations for Salt River Fields, starts pacing, heaving his short frame across the small booth in three strides, pivoting, and then heaving back. Since the season's gotten underway, the man's year-round tan has deepened to a strange reddish-orange, almost the color of a tawny port. Just don't fuck up again, okay? Nowadays, they've got computers to do what you do. One touch and Joe's shoulders up to the keyboard, forcing Lester towards the higher octaves. He checks that the machine is off, then concentrates on the many buttons and keys and decides to press the big white one, C, an octave below middle. He holds it down with a fat finger. Lester notices that his boss's cuticles are a mess. No, 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 Joe sings and lifts his index. One button. Charge, Lester says, sounding deflated. Below, the kid hits a soft ground ball to second. It's an easy out. Exactly. Joe crosses the room and reaches for the doorknob. I know you've been doing this since the Jurassic, Lester, but you're in my stadium now, and I want it to be right. I'm watching you. A quick one, too the door slamming shut and the ball cracking against the bat, and Lester whips his head back to the field. Jimmy Cardozo has made solid connection with his first pitch. The ball sails over the shortstop's head, drops shallow of the left fielder, and starts a slow roll in the diamond cut grass. The catcher accelerates around, the fir around first and slides into second, just under the baseman's tag. Lester rushes for the on button and places his hands on the keys. His fanfare, a rising chord familiar under his fingers. Da -na 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 -na, he sings along. Only as the last chord resonates over the field does he realize the song was performed by a chorus of cats. Um, and so the chapter weaves between Lester and uh, William Goslin, that guy who grounded out. And so I'm skipping forward a few pages um, to a section with William. William leaves the stadium in a funk. 
he'd known it would be weird being the youngest guy on the team, the rookie straight out of high school. Objectively, he knew he'd get cut too. It was unheard of for a recruit, even a spectacular one, to jump straight to the majors. But through those months of psyching himself up for the big fucking debut, he'd hoped that it, he would be the exception. Look at Matthews, who's another rookie. He thinks now, two home runs this week. There's talk of him starting with the club, not even stopping at Salt Lake. Meanwhile, William has been batting like shit, even after 200 hours with that cranky old batting coach and can hardly hang on to the ball at first. Every Thursday this spring has felt like his head is in a guillotine, waiting for the Friday cut he knows is coming. Instead, Dorsey Payne calls him in and gives him an envelope of meal money with hardly more than a nod and the line, don't spend it all in one place. The parking lot is emptying out, a few TV trucks packing up in the press section. William weaves through a pair of rented Mustangs and goes past Jason Goodyear's beat up Jeep. He recognizes Stephen Smith, one of the owners of the team, as his Audi glides by and lifts a hand to wave. The man at the wheel does not acknowledge him. He's probably feeling pretty bad about his investment right now. William sidles up to a 2011 Porsche, custom painted lion's gold his baby born of his signing bonus. His parents sat William down months before the draft to talk to him about financial planning and long-term savings, but they had allowed him this and how he loves it. He drove it the 2,400 miles from Bayhead, New Jersey to Scottsdale, Arizona, an act of rebellion that made Sheila Gosling, Gosling a hoverer even among helicopter parents, crazy, but he was only a couple of speeding tickets worse for wear and even a week's worth of road food the wrappers wadded up in the footwell of the passenger seat hadn't gained him any weight. An ancient old that must have belonged to some janitor or something is parked alongside the Porsche. Whoever parked there clearly can't read. A sign posted above the car says players only. William starts up his car with a satisfying purr. He looks over his shoulder for traffic, sets the car in reverse and crunch. He sees the end of the olds through his rearview mirror. Muttering to himself, he pulls forward, parks, and gets out to inspect the damage. The car is an ugly thing, rusty, a rusty Cutlass Supreme in a taupe that might have been white once. It's angled 15 degrees off parallel, not really between the lines at all. It's a wonder it didn't hit his Porsche on the way in, he thinks. William glass, glances inside the dusty window, the back seats covered with sheet music, unopened mail, a few days worth of Arizona Republics, and tucked underneath some papers, the plastic top of a cheap bottle of booze. He crouches down next to the old long back flank. A fleck of gold paint from his bumper is pressed onto the metal, and the point of contact on each car is slightly indented. He tries to rub the metallic stamp off with his thumb, then licks the finger and tries again. He turns around to see if anyone has noticed him. His stomach churns. Could he just go? Where'd you get me? The man who asks is lean to the point of skinny, tan, and creased like worn leather. His hair, a fluffy white rim that rounds a sizable bald spot, is a little long and very must. And his eyes are wide and watery behind large, out-of-date frames. William Stanner stammers, I, I, I. The old man stoops to study the mark. He's so close, William can smell him. Vodka plus an aftershave that reminds him of his grandfather. His scalp is dotted with sunspots. I'm so sorry, sir. If there's anything I can do, I mean, repairs or whatever. The old man beams a mouthful of grain teeth. To this old car, I reckon it's older than you. Well, still, I feel awful. Right, the man squints. You're that Willie Gosling kid, aren't you? Yes, sir. He feels his face flush. Having a go of it, huh? First time out is always sorta. A modified golf cart zips around the corner, a wobbly stack of sod flapping on its flatbed. Hey, the driver calls. Hey, hey. The machine whirs over a curb cut, tottering momentarily, then speeds towards the men, swerving and stopping just behind William's rear bumper. Driver, a tan man in a polo shirt and two short shorts, purses his lips and flares his nose. Mr. Goslin, is Lester bothering you? The monogram on his chest has the Salt River Fields logo and under it an embroidered title, Director of Stadium Ops. No, I was just, William wonders how to best explain the situation. Would they call the cops for something like this? 
He thinks about the overdue tickets in his glove compartment. That's the last thing he needs. Sheila would have a conniption. Before he could come up with a plan, Templeton says he's not supposed to be here. Staff parking's past third base. He's glaring at the old man as he indicates the farther lot. Says players, I play. The old man winkles his fingers in, an, in the air and flashes a cro crooked grin. Keyboards don't count. Templeton barks and points more vigorously. Over there, Lester. Okay, okay. The old man sho shows his palms and surrender. I'll get going. And you won't do it again. The short man turns his gaze and makes a concerned face. Mr. Goslin, I'm very sorry for this inconvenience. It's okay. William's confused more than anything else, but before he can ask what just happened, the golf cart has zoomed off, leaving with a poof of exhaust. We all get our knocks, huh, kid? With that, the old man raps on the trunk of his car twice, gets in, and drives away. On his way out of the lot, he honks, sticks a hand out the car window, and waves. Good game, goody. William hadn't noticed, but Jason Goodyear is standing at the edge of the lot. Did he see this whole debacle? William raises a hand hello, and the left fielder nods before walking away. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, I will save my question for the end, but I'm very curious what research you did to, to write this. So just prepare yourself. I'm sure you've answered that question a million times already. OK, um, next up is Jesus. Uh, Jesus Valles is a queer Mexican immigrant, writer, performer from Juarez, El Paso. Jesus's work has been supported by Lambda Literary, Community of Writers, Idlewild Arts, Undocu Poets, Ten House, and The Poetry Incubator. Their work has been featured in The New Republic, Quarterly West, NPR, and elsewhere. They are the author and performer of Undocuments, for which they earned two B. Iden Payne Awards. Jesus is currently Outsider Festival's Outsider in Residence. In lieu of purchasing a book, please consider donating to the Front, Front to Reese's Fianza Fund. The fund provides support for still detained people through small deposits to commissary and telephone accounts, the payment of immigrant bonds, and miscellaneous expenses upon release. And that link, I believe, is in the, yes, it is. It's in the chat along with the, the links to books. OK, Jesus, the, the floor is yours. Hi, um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be that person on the Zoom call. <laughs> can, can you all hear me? Okay, awesome. <laughs> oh, I feel like that's like part of like the ritual of, of starting a reading. Is <laughs> how's my sound? Um, so um, I have El Paso as my background behind me. Um, I'm working on um, a piece that has been commissioned by a piece I've been wanting to write and and that has thankfully been commissioned and, and received support from, uh, from Outsider Festival. Uh, the piece is called uh, Mala Fruta, uh, Bullet Fruit. Um, and it is, about, it is about bullets. It's about our relationship to bullets in the United States, um, how they choreograph the way we move our bodies um, and, and, and how, how bullets remain as, as ghosts in our heads long after they've, they've killed what they kill. Um, uh, the section that I'm going to read from specifically, uh, so the, the piece is divided into six sections. Um, the piece that I'm going to be reading from tonight is the, um, the last section of, of the show. Um, I won't read like the, the whole thing, uh, so it'll be a, a truncated version of it. Um, and it is about the, um, the shooting that happened in El Paso on August 3rd of 2019. Um, and yeah. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I am a playwright. Uh, I also, you know, work in poetry a little bit. Um, uh, a lot of the work that I do is autobiographical. So um, the show, in many ways, is sort of structured um, with me as, as different sort of um, characters, all of them me, but in different sort of uh, positionalities. So um, I'll start. In my head, there's a bullet. It got there by making a door through the head of a would-be Mexican president. 
I was eight years old when I watched my first gun murder on the news. My parents watched the TV and said, it's because he was gonna be good. When you're good to people, they kill you. In my head, there's a the sound of that moment, not, not the bullets, but the din of the Logan airport over the television screens and my city on all those screens and all those cop cars. The captain on the TV says, screaming in Spanish and, and people at the Logan airport roll their suitcases through, pause, look at the screen, shake their heads, roll their suitcases through. I call home. My parents are in front of the television, sifting through the remains and, and I wait for them to break the world open for me once again. The mom says, it's very sad. We die there, we die here. My brain is buzzing. I'm in Boston and I'm on the way to Los Angeles for a writing retreat, but, but I wanna be with my border. I hate the thing, the, the, the line, the wall, the bridge checkpoints, but I love my home. Right between those two cities, right in between. My home is made from that in between. My sister calls me to tell me she's anxious because, because the working class probabilities of having to shop at a Walmart for back to school supplies on a tax free weekend in El Paso is almost an event because a few days before this, it was a garlic festival because a few years ago, because a few weeks back, because in a few days, because in a few weeks, because it always happens again. Because airports are always in between things. My head is filled with bees right now and, and I just wish I was home. CNN says the El Paso shooting suspect identified as 21 year old Patrick Cruces from the Dallas Fort Worth area. I somehow fly to Los Angeles to this writing retreat. I'm in this airplane and the world is happening right below me. And I don't think it means anything except that I'm very small and alive and very lucky. At the retreat, the, the workshop leader welcomes us. Hi, I just wanna welcome you all. And, and I wanna thank you for your brave and beautiful poems. Putting together this workshop has been such a delight and, and I'm, I'm excited to hear your work and to hopefully put more work into the world. So why don't we start with it's coming, that part it's coming. He's going to ask us to introduce ourselves. What is our name? Where are we from? What are some goals for the workshop? I just want to make sure that we get to know each other in this space before we get to the writing, the softest parts of us, the work. So why don't we just share a bit about ourselves and where we're from? I've been answering questions like this all summer. I should have this shit down. My name is David and I'm a poet and performer and I'm leading this poetry workshop. I've been practicing icebreakers all summer, different conference, different place, same format, same structure, always the icebreaker. I should have this down. And I'm from, and it's that question, where are you from? I think that's always the hardest question because it's August 5th, 2019, and I am from El Paso. Well, from Juarez, which is El Paso too. And, and it always makes the question, where are you from, a strange question, because I want to say I'm from both places, which really is one place. Like, I can walk into El Paso anywhere. I can say, and I would get responses in Juarez and in El Paso, in both cities, you know, which, which makes the split that much more complicated, which is why I hate that we call El Paso and Juarez sister cities, why I hate that we call them sisters at all. I imagine some heinous magician chopping his assistant in half looking at the two halves of the poor girl in the chopping box and then proclaiming, look, what gorgeous sisters, while the girl just sits there chopped in complete bleeding, which is why it's hard to say where I'm from because I'm from a chopped place. And today is August 5th and it's been two days or, or less than two days. And on the plane here, someone asked me where I was from and I told them and they, they just looked so it's coming. So um, why don't we go to you next? Oh, um, uh, my name is uh, Jesus, and I am from Ciudad Juarez slash El Paso, Texas. There it is. Mm. A tiny mm, a pity of an mm, the, the eyes soft and the solemn lot, like, like, I'm sorry. And it's coming that, 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 that part where the mouth rounds out, where, 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 where he's going to push out a silent, slow, I'm sorry. And I want to say for what? You know, I, I want to say for, for, for what? What are you sorry for? You didn't, you know, oh, what are you? I want to say everything. I want to say, fuck. 
my brain is all jumbled and I want to say that I don't ever want to hear anyone say I'm sorry when I tell them I'm from Ciudad Juarez because sometimes all I hear is, oh, you sad, sad, should be dead person. You sad, sad Mexican with all your sadness and your trail of bodies dragging behind you. And they're so wrong because I, I can't talk about the dead without also talking about the living. All at the same time that the women were disappearing into the night and emerging from the sand, other women were marching, were alive and laughing. How everyone kept calling Juarez the deadliest city in the world. And we still party and shoot the shit and go out for colitas de pavo. And how funny it is that turkey ass is a delicacy in this city. Like, what? <laughs> and we laugh and we were alive, but all anyone can ever see is our dead. And the easiest way to kill a people is to imagine them already dead. So they did. They imagined us all dead. The whole world imagined us dead from our city of the dead. And my response, my, my always response, my pithy, small, wrong-ass defense against I'm sorry was always, you know, El Paso is one of the safest cities in the U.S., like probably the safest. And the other person would always smile and say, really? Oh, cool. And I would just blather on about how I used to sneak into gay clubs when I was 16 and how fun our dumbass trips to Walmart at like three in the morning were and how nothing ever happens in El Paso. And now, now it's August 5th. And now it's been two days, maybe less than two full days since August 3rd. And now, now when I say the words El Paso, less than two full days after, now people say, I'm sorry. They, they mouth it real quiet, soft, I'm sorry, like that. And, 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 and I wanna say, stop, fucking stop it because, because there's nothing to be sorry for. Because I'm not looking for pity because El Paso is still the same place where I kissed a boy openly on the street for the very first time. And it's the same place where Sam, my best friend in high school, and I would walk around downtown at 4 a.m. and we were 16 and we didn't care because this giant city is such a small pueblo. And it's the same El Paso where the Cholita, the Hillcrest, and the Goth girls were essentially indistinguishable. Everyone listens to Morrissey. Everyone wears thick eyeliner. Fuck it. And they were the most loyal friends I'll ever have. And it's the same El Paso where I came out in sixth grade because Danny Flores told everybody and somehow I gained more friends. It's the same El Paso where you went to Chico's Tacos and you saw this lady with long nails who would serve you and be like, what do you want? Okay, no, I'm sorry, baby. No, 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 it's cash only. No. And then she pointed the person behind you to take your place because you know shit better than that. Go get your cash and come back and get your hot dog and your double with extra cheese and shut up. And it's the same El Paso where Angela, the candy lady at the gay bars called you mi amor, mi rey. And she gave you all, and she gave you and all your loud, drunk gay friends free candy because you bought her a shot once. And then one year while you were away, you got the news that somebody hit her with their car and killed her near the bars on Cincinnati Street. And how it's the same El Paso where my mommy knows every Sun Metro bus driver and every other lady on that bus, and they all do for each other because El Paso is its people, and its people are somehow always home, even miles and miles away. I want to say El Paso is still the same place where my niece runs around Yucca Park and gets on those hot ass plastic swings because when you feel nothing but love around you, you don't care about a hot ass plastic swing. You just trust the world in the way you only can here. It's the same El Paso where I first lived with my, with my very first boyfriend at our very first apartment right across the street from the university. And we never really locked our door because we were undergrads and we didn't have shit anyway because we always felt safe in this city. The city where one of my friends tells me how one time she goes to this bar across the border and she walks into this dirty bathroom and there's two girls fighting in the bathroom. And one of the girls is grabbing the other girl's hair and grinding her face into the floor where someone's broken a glass. And then I think she said the next day, she walks into class and sees her right there in algebra. It was high school and, and we all drank in Juarez, a rite of passage. If you didn't cross the bridge to get drunk by the time you were 17, did you even graduate? It's that El Paso, the one where you stare out at rows and rows of girls in your senior class in their best curl sets, seated and waiting for their diplomas. And it's so exciting and it's so scary. And four years go by so fast. Remember that time that my senior class had a sexiest lady contest in high school and I won? Why did we have a sexiest lady contest in high school? Why did our teachers host the contest? Why is this city like this? It's the same El Paso where I first got to when we first crossed over. 
and I was fat and shy and scared and I didn't know English. And Adrian Vasquez, the most popular boy in fourth grade, picked me for his dodgeball team at P because he knew I was scared and shy and fat and needed a friend because in this weird place, in this weird, strange piece of lovely all the way out on the westmost tip of Texas, in El Paso, we do for each other. It's weird, it's, it's so weird. And I wish, I wish I could tell people how it works, how it is that El Paso people just sort of find each other everywhere, all of the time. El Paso people, Juarez people, we just find each other everywhere. That is the covenant of this place is that we find each other everywhere. It's the strangest thing I'm most proud of. And then, and then it is August 3rd. And I just keep seeing all those cop cars on TV next to that Hooters and that Sam's and that Walmart. Every place the Sun Metro bus ever took me when I was young. Every place I loved, every place I know, the videos, the screens, the shots, their faces, all of it. And today is August 5th and I feel like I love my cities, my home, my place more than I think I ever have right now. And I don't want, I'm sorry. I want everyone to know how much I love that I'm from there. I love where I'm from and I wish people wouldn't say I'm sorry like it was inevitable. Like, we, like this was the only natural conclusion for my home because it wasn't. I wish I could just show, I, I wish you would just know, I wish people would just know my people. I wish they would know how much life we're capable of, how much life blooms in the desert always, how the moon always looks most pregnant and radiant there, how the sunsets there are my favorite kind of fire. I wish people would know what it means to live there, to love it. I wanna say all of that, and more than that, I just want, I want to be there and not at this writing retreat because right now I don't want to make anything. I don't want to write another word that doesn't lead me back to Loma Land or Yarbrough or Williamette or North Loop or Piedras or Dyer or any street where someone will call me mijo. Really, I want everything. I want anything to just take me home. I, I want to say all of this but it's August 5th and my brain hurts and it feels like my heart and my lungs ran away from me and my head is full of bees and, and I just open my dumb mouth and I finish the dumbass icebreaker like, hi, I'm Jesus. I'm from Ciudad Juarez slash El Paso, Texas. And, um, and uh, I guess uh, I just, um, I wanna write about home, I think. I want to write about my home. I think about bullets a lot, about what I should do if I should ever meet one one day when I walk into work. I think about how many bullets my large body could possibly take before any of them get to my students. I think about how much more impossible it is for this math to happen at a nightclub at a Walmart. My niece is an eight-year-old student in El Paso, which is in the United States of America, which means Someday, I may not run fast enough to catch anything that may be shot her way. So I think about bullets a lot. I've lost people to bullets they met by their own hand. I've lost people to strangers' bullets. I think often about how many of us might meet ourselves when we are asked to make decisions about bullets. It has been months. I've only recently been able to, to grasp bad language again, although I don't think it matters much. Most days my head still feels full of, of some awful bit of lead rattling. One morning, my niece, nine years old now, begs my mother, Abuelita, podemos ir al Walmart para ponerle flores a la gente. Even she wants to offer a tribute to the dead. Even she wants something to bloom after the bullet. Still, everybody in El Paso goes up and goes to work in that city. In El Paso, even as they miss someone, they move through this beautiful, sexy desert mountain mother of a place, even as she changes shapes. The senoras smile at each other on the bus. Someone is getting shit faced right now at Mulligan's again, laughing too loud with their call center buddies. Last year at Fox Plaza, a woman handed me a torta de colita de pavo. 
She said, aquí tiene mi hijo. I think, I think we are the opposite of a bullet. I think we are the opposite of everything that kills. We only got us. It is everything we need. Thank you, Jesus. That was that was terrific. Um, our last reader, I'm <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble transitioning. Um, I saw Jesus read. I was lucky enough to see Jesus read uh, uh, last year at the um, at the writers' conference when we actually had it in person, and 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 knew um, knew he was a great reader. But wow, there's something about the intimacy of Zoom that that intensifies the experience. Anyway, thank you, Jesus. Um, okay, our last reader is uh, Laura Vandenberg. Laura is the author of five books, most recently the story collection, I Hold a Wolf by the Ears. And I wanna mention The Third Hotel, which I read this summer and which is a really terrific and weird and fascinating book. Um, it's a novel. Born and raised in Florida, Laura splits her time between Central Florida and the Boston area and is currently in Central Florida. Okay, Laura, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm super happy to be with you all this evening, and it's great to read with um, Matthew and um, Emily and Jesus. Thank you for like three incredible readings. Um, I'm gonna read from a story in Wolf called Your Second Wife, and I'm gonna start at the beginning, so there's nothing you need to know. Um, yeah, and the story is written in sections, so I will, I will read the titles as I'm going along. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I think I'll probably be able to read maybe like half the story and then I'll, I'll stop. So if the ending seems abrupt, it's not like the actual ending. Um, just a, a, a way station. Um, your second wife, uh, gig economy. The photograph arrives in a padded manila envelope pressed between two sheets of cardboard. The picture is a headshot with a blue nothing background of a corporate portrait. The dead wife wears a starched white blouse and a black jacket, gray irises like slivers of ice, a modest toothless smile, tasteful gold studs in her earlobes. Her name is, was Beth Butler, and she was killed in a hiking accident five weeks ago. As a grief freelancer, this is not the first time I've received such a photo, nor is it the first time the photo has been mailed with such care. The husbands, I have yet to be hired by a wife, contact me at a designated email. I send them an online questionnaire and request a photograph be mailed to a PO box because I like to be able to hold the wives in my hands and, as my sister has pointed out many times before, I can't be giving these grieving husbands my home address. Next, I require three videos of the wives in their natural environments, delivering a work presentation or jogging along a river or carrying a birthday cake into a crowded singing room. Then I need a week to prepare and then we meet. Between impersonating dead wives, I work as a part-time dog walker and a part-time landscaper and a part-time food delivery courier. What an unbelievably exhausting moment to be alive in this era of the gig economy. The overcoat. I never meant to get into this line of work, though I cannot deny that I've always enjoyed being other people. In college, I interviewed to be, to be a wealthy woman's personal assistant. Over lunch, she asked me if I knew the difference between torturous and torturous, between adverse and averse. Once it was apparent that I did not, she told me that the ability to make these fine distinctions was a critical skill in a personal assistant and that I should not bother ordering dessert. It was late fall and the wealthy woman arrived wearing a magnificent fur coat, quarter length and dyed lavender. When the woman went to the bathroom, she left her coat slung over the back of her chair and I walked out with it. 
I wore the lavender fur all through the winter and was transformed from a student who slept in the backs of lecture halls to one who made the dean's list. Every time I took a test, I imagined being a young woman of great means, of waking each morning to find my future rolled out before me, free of obstacle and horizon. Old pal. I discovered my gift for impersonating dead wives quite by accident. It was the year after college and I dreamed of attending architecture school because I wanted to build skyscrapers. Then my best friend's wife died of a brain aneurysm and he did not leave his bed for a month. I was working part-time for a theater makeup artist and I brought in a photo of my best friend's dead wife and asked for her help. Three hours later, I turned up at his door in a frosted blonde wig and tinted contacts and a prosthetic chin. I had even broken into his garage and gotten some of her clothes out of storage, a linen dress, strappy sandals, a black crossbody purse. Let's get going, I said when he answered the door. His clothes were rumpled, his breath rank, he was barefoot and his toenails had grown into small talons or we'll miss the movie. We strolled arm in arm to the theater as I knew he and his wife used to do every Sunday. After the matinee, we had a drink on the patio of a nearby restaurant, as was their custom, and I ordered her drink, an old pal, even though I can't stand rye whiskey and so considered this flourish to be nothing less than an act of love. Forget about skyscrapers, my best friend said as I walked him home. This right here is your calling. Later, he told his grieving colleague about what I had done, and then that colleague told a neighbor, and then I had word of mouth, and then I had cards for a business called Your Second Wife. More photographs of dead wives came in the mail, and suddenly I had four part-time jobs instead of three and was too busy to apply to architecture school. On the city streets, I would gaze up at skyscrapers and wonder what had ever happened to that person who had wanted to build such great and terrible things? Marco Polo. Your second wife is two years old and my sister still thinks I'm a part-time prostitute. She lives in Australia and we communicate primarily through an app called Marco Polo. Most mornings I wake to find a new video, usually filmed in her kitchen or in her bathroom, as she holds her toothbrush up like a saber. I hope you're being careful, she tells me. I hope you're using protection. Again and again I tell her no sex of any kind is the first item on my contract, and I only meet grieving husbands in public spaces. I once had to turn down a job because the husband told me his dead wife was agoraphobic and never left the house. I have binge watched all the seasons of Law & Order SVU, so I know what's out there. I'll give my sister this much though. While I am not exchanging sex for money, my most lucrative asset has still turned out to be my body. After your second wife hit the six month mark, I felt a wash in cash and treated myself to overdue dental work. Australia. Not long before I started your second wife, I visited my sister and her husband in Australia and had jet lag for 27 days. One evening I was sitting at their kitchen table reading Positive, a book I had been directed to study if I wanted to continue my part-time job as a dog walker while my sister and her husband cooked dinner. I kept getting distracted and looking out the window to see if anything was happening in the alleyway below. I smelled chicken fat and balsamic. The clock ticked on the wall. The minute hand was five past the hour when I briefly became invisible. The window no longer held my reflection. I could not make out a body filling the chair. I picked up positive in the glass pane the book levitated. I watched my sister and her husband stuff butter pats and rosemary twigs under the chicken skin, oblivious to the metaphysical marvel occurring in their home. I wondered if my condition was permanent, and if so, if it could somehow become profitable. 
I was almost disappointed when the spell passed in less than a minute like a fleeting headache, my reflection a pale flame in the window once more. My sister will tell you that this episode was merely a jet lag induced hallucination, but I believe it was a premonition, a sign. The Claremont Killer. On this morning's video, my sister says that the police have finally apprehended the Claremont killer who stalked the streets of Perth in the 90s. The police have released footage that shows one of the victims outside a hotel waiting for a taxi. She nods at a man lurking on the edge of the frame. The camera changes its view and when it switches back to the hotel entrance, the young woman is gone. My sister says that if you freeze the video, you can see the profile of the killer's face, sharp and bright, like the fin of a shark hunting a night ocean. Until his arrest, he was the president of the Perth Junior Athletics Club. Today is the day I am scheduled to meet Beth Butler's husband, and I know this is my sister's way of telling me to be careful. Part three. Parts one and two of the online questionnaire are similar to what a person would find in an application for a mortgage, that is if lenders accepted applications from the deceased. Part three is where the husbands run into trouble. At this stage, sometimes one will tell me that he can't complete part three and the job is canceled. This is because part three forces the husbands to get into what they would have rather not known about their wives or to confront how little they understood their private worlds. What is the worst thing you ever suspected her of? When was the last time she burst into tears without explanation? What was her kink? Name all the ways she ever betrayed you. Comb through her remaining toiletries and send an itemized list. Did she use pads or tampons or a menstrual cup? What brand? How long did her cycles last? Did she ever bleed on the sheets? Experience has taught me that nothing makes the husbands more uneasy than being interrogated about the menstrual cycles of their wives. Stockings. Beth Butler preferred Kotex tampons, the same brand she'd used since she was 16. Her lipstick colors were all classics, Lady Dangerous, Bruised Plum, Cherries in the Snow. Impersonating her will require a prosthetic nose, tinted contacts, highlights, and teeth whitening treatments as Beth Butler had unbelievably white teeth. She was five foot eight, making it necessary for me to wear a kitten heel. From the video footage, I learned that, irrespective of occasion or season, Beth Butler always wore the same black glitter stockings, the kind a teenage girl might slide into on prom night in the name of festiveness. Worlds of Mystery When she was alive, Beth Butler loved visiting the planetarium. I meet her husband at the entrance holding two tickets. You're late, I say, because Beth Butler arrived early for everything and was thus always chiding people for running behind. I take his hand and together we sail through the planetarium's dark rooms. We sit in a theater and watch a video called Moons, Worlds of Mystery. The moons that orbit across the screen look like giant marbles. When one of the moons explodes, a child somewhere behind us cries out. I learn that exomoons are natural satellites orbiting giant alien planets, which I will admit I did not know before today. I can't claim that the gig economy doesn't ever teach me anything. In the parking lot, I'm supposed to say, I'm going to swing by the market and pick up clams for dinner. Beth Butler's signature dish was linguine with clams and then head to the tea where the train cars would be crowded at this time of day. But the husband breaks the script by asking if I need a ride home. The clouds move swiftly above our heads. My glitter stockings itch. I say the line about the clams and then spin around. My heels are clicking fast across the asphalt when a shadow looms behind me and a lunging hand presses a white cloth to my mouth. And I'll stop there. Ah, cliffhanger. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs>
Now, the link for everyone who wants to, to read the rest of that story, again, the link is in the, is in the chat. Um, thank you, all of you. That was, that was a great hour. Um, thank you so much for, for reading for us. And uh, now Gwen will moderate the Q&A. So I have my question, which I already said, but I will open the floor to other people to start. But Gwen, you can, you can use my question about research if you don't get an immediate taker. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you so much to all four of you. That was just, that was amazing and wonderful. And, and I enjoyed it so enormously. Um, so for all of our audience tonight, there's kind of, as Leah said at the very beginning of the reading, there's two ways to ask questions. Um, feel free to type your question into the chat and I'll read it and, and let the, the writers respond. Or you can use the raise hand feature in the participant section of Zoom. And that'll just bring up a little blue hand in the participant section and then I'll say your name and you can pop your video up and ask yourself. So um, I'll give you guys time to type and to ponder. Uh, and we can start with Leah's question uh, to Emily, which is how did you uh, do the, the, how did you do the research for that book? Um, every which way, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong baseball fan and I've been going to Arizona, um, God, for 25 years. But uh, I, I went when I was a kid, but you know, not when I was two, so you can do the math. Um, yeah, so I had a sense of place from that. The particular story about the organist, um, growing up, I was a very serious jazz saxophonist of all things and was like in a jazz band and it was a lot of, um, I, I saw the the world and that sounds cheesy, but like I went to, I traveled all over the States and went to Europe a few times and was able to play music all over and um, met a lot of musicians through that and became fans of even more musicians just through through study. And so um, I had a sense of who Lester might be and you know what kind of music he cares about and how he might try to hang on to his musicianship, even as you know the physical um, mechanisms of of performance were were starting to fail him um so so that part came pretty easy the writing about music um actually well after i drafted this chapter i was at an event in western massachusetts and someone said oh you like baseball right and i said sure and and uh she said the uh, organist for the fenway for Fenway Park is sitting over there. And I like ran across the room and I was just like, excuse me, um, can I, can we have dinner? Can I like basically fact check this chapter with you? Um, and he was like a little startled, um, but really sweet. And um, he, his name's Josh Cantor and he, um, we had a meal and talked about the book and I got it mostly right. <laughs> and. Um, you know, we, we've kept in touch and he was like, next time you're in Boston, come up and I'll, I'll show you the booth. Um, obviously that couldn't happen this year. Um, but, but he did come to my book event in Boston, which was really sweet. So I, so research was everything from that, like from haranguing an organist in Western Massachusetts to, uh, you know, a lot of sports journalism. Um, there was a really bad reality TV show starring Pete Rose. Um, called Pete Rose Hits and Misses, MRS, um, that was helpful both for the domestic life and um, gambling, both. So I could, it, it was a long list, Leah, I could go on, but I want to hear from everyone, so. Oh Lord, yeah, I'm curious misses. about whether other people work from, from research or not, and if so, how they, how they approach it. But also, let me say to those of you who read tonight, you're getting, Lots of compliments in the chat. So if you don't have the chat on, um, take take a look at that. So if any of you want to leap in on the research question, we don't actually have any questions in the chat at the moment. But I, I also would be really interested, as Leah is, um, how much you guys work from from research, if if you do, and if so, how you go about it. I mean, I, I can jump in. Um, I'm working on a novel right now about a woman from Latvia who comes to the United States as a mail order bride in 1993. 
and she's born with wings. She's from a sort of small town in a region of Latvia called Latgale. Um, I've never been to Latvia. I've been doing some research by, you know, reading books, talking to Latvian people in New York, watching movies from the Baltic region, things like that. But a lot of it, I'm just kind of making up. So I'd say in my case, it's mostly imagination and some research, enough research to kind of feel like I'm getting, you know, facts and, and you know, the feel of the country when I need it. Um, but but definitely a lot of imagination. Um, I mean, I think I've come at it different, different ways, like depending on the nature of the project. Uh, like my last novel, The Third Hotel, did necessitate um, a lot of research in many different directions. And I, I read, um, I mean, it's about a, a bunch of different stuff um, as novels tend to be, but in part about film and about horror films specifically. And I read like a huge amount of film theory and also got to watch, you know, Halloween and The Shining in the middle of the day and act like that was writing, um, which was, that was pretty cool. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, research is, I, I feel, um, like, I think sometimes there's this sort of understanding of, of, of research as a thing that we do when we're trying to like write into something that maybe we have limited information about or we have a, a certain amount of information, but we need to know more, we need to go deeper. And um, I remember being really struck by uh, Alexander Cheese has um, an essay um, called the autobiography of my novel in his really beautiful essay collection, um, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, where he talks about writing his first novel, which is set largely in Maine, where he grew up. Um, and and to, to say that it occurred to him at a certain point in the process that like autobiographical fiction sometimes necessitated as much research as fiction that like departs from our lived experiences in more dramatic ways. And that's something that I've been really thinking a lot about recently. I'm working on a longer project now that's set in my hometown in Florida. And in some ways, like the deeper I get into it, I, I can see how like my sort of um, understanding of place and education around place um, is like is limited in some ways and that there's a lot that I don't know and that I need to know. Um, and so that's kind of been in the space that that I, that I've been in right now, just to speak to that sort of thinking about like, what does it mean to sort of research or actively in investigate a place where we do have a, tr a tremendous amount of lived experience where I lived here for 22 years. Um, and yet there are things that that I don't know um, that I feel like, you know, I, I want and, and need to know. So so yeah, I think my, my relationship, and then sometimes just like life is research, you know, in, it, in its way. But um, yeah, I think my, my sort of relationship to research can sh shift really dramatically from project to project. I think, um, I think in my case, um, you know, uh, largely because, um, uh, uh, you know, performance work I do, I, I, thus far it's been really autobiographical. I, I think it's been a lot about sort of um, in, in the first show and the documents where, where I talk about, um, so the, the show is about like, coming to the United States as an undocumented person and then what happens as I am able to gain naturalization and my brother is deported, right? So this sort of uh, or dueling histories about documentation. And I think for that show, I think there was a lot of kind of like um, familial archival work. So a lot of digging mm -hmm. up. Um, my brother my brother actually um, was uh, a really fantastic baseball player and, and played for the, uh, for the Mexican National Little Leagues um, and eventually was a member of their other league. There was like an international like little league thing um, that, that he was then a part of. Um, which becomes a, 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 a pretty significant part of the show uh, of Undocuments. Um, and so um, doing that, that research for that particular section, I think like, I remember a lot about sort of like, um, my brother still has uh, so many like news clippings and an interesting sort of contract from that time in his life. And, and, uh, and my mother always refers to that time as, as the moment where, where he could have been a citizen. Um, and 
So yeah, I, I think one, there's, there's a lot of conversation with, with documents in, in my work. Um, two, in this particular show that I'm writing now in, in Balajuta, um, there's a section that, that I, I have not yet written because, because I'm in kind of the throes of research, um, specifically as they concern um, Harlan Carter, who is, so Harlan Carter is the person who then transforms the NRA into what it is today. Um, by joining the border patrol and then eventually joining the NRA and kind of like lionizing the NRA to become what it is today um, through the murder of, uh, of this boy named uh, Ramon Casiano, who was 15 years old. So uh, Harlan Carter kills uh, Ramon Casiano um, and, and there's, there's a section that I have not yet written because I, am, I, I want to do that story service. Um, but I, as, when I read that story first, I kept thinking about, about how far Harlan Carter's bullet traveled, right? That, that it, it reverberates um, in, in the killing of, of the Texas Rangers, uh, 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 in the killing of Mexicans by Texas Rangers. Uh, it, it reverberates in that shooting in El Paso. It reverberates in, 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 in so many of the state sanctioned killings that, that I think that, that we see. So um, digging into that particular history, I think right now is definitely um, uh, something that I'm finding like productive and and also tense as as I sort of trace that genealogy um, to our present moment. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, we have a, a question in the chat from uh, Itan Kerfinel. Kerfinel, my apologies. It says, uh, "I'm wondering how the readers became such good public readers. Good job, readers." Uh, I would love to hear about any of that process they can share, or if it's just a matter of doing a lot of it. Thank you all again. Um, I can answer that. I got professional help. <laughs> uh, I, I still don't think I'm, I'm not, I'm still not comfortable in front of a camera or in front of a microphone, but when I started, um, uh, at the magazine, I had a lot more public speaking and uh, we didn't have it this year because coronavirus, but usually we have a big 500 person fundraiser where we, uh, I'm, I'm the MC and I was just quaking in my high heels. And, and so I, um, a friend of mine trained as a Shakespearean actor and he um, taught me to like, pretend I was talking to someone 12 feet away um, and speak a little more slowly than I thought made sense. And, and when we did this, when, when the webcam thing started happening, I called him and I was like, can you help me? I need, I need another training. So I, I've, I've asked for help and it's just a practice, I think. Yeah, I, I, I mean, same, Emily. I think I don't always feel um, it's it's not my most at at home place. The the um, reading, but I the thank you for your thank you for your kind words. Um, never nevertheless, um, to the the asker of the question. But I think yeah. I mean, I do think practice. It's like um, it's like exposure therapy. You know, for me, it's like I can remember a time where I got so nervous before reading like I would just it was like every like part of my body would start like sweating and I you know and I would feel sort of like nauseous all day if I was reading at night and have that like terrible sort of yeah like churning like that jingle jingly feeling um and yeah and I and and I and that has certainly eased over time and I do think that it is just kind of like practice and exposure um, but, you know, I think also for me, um, I do read, I do read my work aloud a lot, particularly in the later stages, like in the line editing stages. And I think that that, um, I think it helps make um, the transition to reading it 
to an audience feel a little bit less strange just because I am used to hearing the work aloud. I have a chance to get kind of like accustomed to like the rhythms of the sentences. And I particularly do this when I'm writing in the first person because I think of like first person so much, um, so much depends on finding like that exact right frequency of voice and tonality. Um, and I think of it, it's a bit like, like turning a dial on a radio, you know, and you're kind of like looking for that right song that you're really in the mood to hear. And you couldn't maybe even say exactly what it is, but when you hit on it, right, when you hit on that right station, you, you, you know it. Um, and that's sort of what writing in the first person feels like to me. And so part of that process of reading aloud is just refining that frequency, refining that frequency, refining that frequency. And so um, when I when I read the first person stories, and I, I think for that reason, like, I mean, there's stories in Wolf that aren't written in the first person. And I think I tend to read those stories less than the first person stories in part because like, I'm more comfortable reading the first person stories because I've really spent a lot of time um, sort of hearing that frequency. So I'm, I'm really, there's a familiarity with how the sentences like sound and feel um, it, like in my mouth, if that, that, that sounds, that does not sound right. But, um, but yeah, the, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a familiarity with how, how, how it feels sort of like said, said aloud. Yeah, I, I agree with um, everything Laura and Emily have said. I mean, for me, I, I'm not a person who likes public speaking or public reading. So I have to rev myself up too. And, and partly it's a matter of practice. I think for me, it's partly a matter of picking something that I feel I can connect to on an emotional level. Sometimes I'll think about different things I've written for a possible reading. And as I'm sort of trying it out, a lot of times it just doesn't feel right for some reason. Like there's too many characters in the first couple of paragraphs and I feel like people are gonna get confused. And so as I was trying to think of something to read tonight, for example, I didn't wanna read any of this novel in progress just because it felt too complicated with all the different names. And I was like, I like reading things about Heike. This felt like a scene that I could connect with emotionally. And so for me, part of it is just kind of finding something that feels right on a personal level. Um, I think that's, I know that that sounds kind of weird, but that is kind of my experience of, of what makes me feel comfortable reading. Yeah, I think um, I, uh, I am actually like, I'm very averse to public speaking um, uh, and, I'm performing, um, and I think that's the reason I do it. Um, I, I came to writing via theater, um, uh, and I think um, I, 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 when I was 27, I, I threw myself into community theater as a way to, um, surprisingly, as a way to not binge drink as much. Um, and it's, it, you know, methods. Um, and, and it was interesting because I, I and I, I kind of want to connect back to to Laura's point about about what 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 happens to our relationship with the word once it occurs in the mouth, and then once 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 the musculature of of, of like once the mechanism of the mouth sort of encounters text, and and the throat has to produce the sound of the word, the the brain I think does go into this kind of editing process. I think as a as an actor, you really feel it because you're like, oh, that, that did not work. Like the word was supposed to do something in scene and, and it didn't. So, so what, um, as an actor, I think the cheat is like, the text is the text. So now I have to figure out how to sneak into it. And I think what's helped a lot is I, I also read my work aloud in, in the later stages. Like I'll finish draft three or four and, and then I'll be like, cool. Now, now I want to move in it. Now I want to speak it. Um, I, I, I edit, um, I edit in movement a lot. Like I, I, I read aloud and I move as I read aloud to just sort of help me find um, really the, the kind of like the, 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 the kinetic sonic sort of the fire in, in whatever um, I'm, I'm doing. So I, I think for me, it's, for me, it, it is one, I speak about the terror of having to speak in public. So I'm like, okay, cool. Like I'm, I'm going to jump. Um, and while you're in it, I think something that fuels me is, is the waiting for it to be over. 
uh, and not in a bad way, but 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 you you know you you really are like, this is almost done. Oh, this is almost done. Um, whenever people ask me, you know, what's your, what's your favorite part of the show, and I'm like, when it's over, like like really when it ends, because you feel like that there is there's a kind of like uh, a relief, like a, a grounding, and at once like you can let yourself go up into the air with it, and I think that 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 that, that um, I find it very helpful to to fuel myself in in that kind of anxiety, which maybe is not the best, most helpful tip, but, but it's, you know, it's something that's worth. I actually would have never guessed, you probably, oh. you probably aren't surprised by this, but I would have never guessed that, that, that you were anxious about public speaking because, um, because you're such a good performer. And it, it's interesting that one of the things